Mrs. Walter Simpson. This convention of the Church of God of Prophecy took place in 1941. Bahamians have always had strong ties to religion. By now, the Catholic, Methodist, and Baptist churches were well established in the Bahamas. These baptismal ceremonies took place at the Western Esplanade, opposite the Western entrance to the harbor formed by Paradise Island. By now, the Second World War had erupted. The British Royal Air Force, in association with U.S. and Canadian forces, used Nassau as a training base and for ferrying Mitchell bombers over to North Africa. The Bahamians were active in the war. Some worked in war-related jobs, others saw active duty. During the war years, a crisis arose at Windsor Field. Black Bahamians working at expansion projects found that they were getting less than half the pay of Americans doing the same job. On the morning of June 1st, 1942, they struck. Milo Butler Sr. was an active supporting voice in the House of Assembly. Great Cambridge leading a formative union. Edgar Bain and Charles Rodriguez also supported the strike, as did Clarence Bain, just returned from civil rights activity in America. Police were called out as tensions built. The riot act was read. Martial law declared. Violence broke out. Two were killed, 28 injured. The governor ordered a special investigation into the strikers' grievances. After days of tension, the men returned to work and salaries were adjusted. The Bahamas was controlled by a group of businessmen who operated on Bay Street. Their dominance and power extended into Bahamian government. They were known as the Bay Street Boys, who reaped enormous profits from the tourist boom that followed the end of World War II. Stafford Sands, then chairman of the development board, expanded tourism from a seasonal to a year-round business. Mass advertising was employed, and it brought in tourists in droves. Pan American Airways, which in the early days of tourism had operated an amphibious terminal from East Bay Street, was joined by other airlines. Luxury cruise ships arrived almost daily. Black Bahamians, however, did not reap many of the benefits of this boom, remaining poor and undereducated, barred from hotels, restaurants, theaters, and even beaches. In 1958, a taxi dispute at International Airport led to a national strike. Private tour cars owned by the Bay Street Boys were monopolizing the airport business. Union taxis led by Clifford Darling were shut out. They struck, and most all other Bahamian workers, including the Bahamas Federation of Labor under Randall Fox, vowed to work not a sweat in support. The strike ran for 19 days, with the names of Rudy Turnquest, James Shepard, Saul Campbell, Cyril Ferguson, and Wilbert Morse emerging. The strike ended with a victory for the taxi union. Their attorney was Lyndon Oscar Pinley. The dramatic Mace incident of April 27, 1965, had an even greater impact. The UBP, or the Bay Street Boys, the ruling minority, sought to redistribute the seats in the House of Assembly in their favor by establishing new voter districts, a move condemned by representatives Pendling, Butler, Hanna, and others as outright gerrymandering. Mr. Pendling strode across the assembly floor and picked up the 265-year-old mace, the symbol of parliamentary authority. To everyone's amazement, he said, this is the symbol of authority, and the authority on this island belongs to the people. Meanwhile, Milo Butler Sr. opened a window. Then Mr. Pimbling threw the gold-plated mace out of that window, onto the hard concrete of the courtyard below. Milo Butler then threw the hourglass that was used to limit his speech out of the same window. Both men march out of the stunned assembly hall and join the throng. The day is now called Black Tuesday, a milestone in Bahamian history. The quiet revolution had begun. Message.
Drs. Finling, Butler, Hanna, Whitfield, and Bain went to New York on August 28, 1965, to appeal to the United Nations Committee on Colonialism for majority rule. We have come to you because we wish you to investigate and help to correct the situation in our island, which is packed with explosive potential. We have come to you because we know that if the situation is allowed to go uncorrected, it might lead to tragic consequences. We have come to you because we share the ideals of peace and of democracy to which this organization is and has been committed for a long, long time. We have come to you because, really, we have no one else to turn to. That same year, Queen Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh visited Nassau. Sir Ralph Gray was governor of the Bahamas, and he led a huge welcome for the royal couple. was underway. The 1967 elections were approaching, and the campaign battle was on to take the nation's political control away from the entrenched base three boys. Campaigning was hard and heavy. Then came the day, January 10th, 1967, election day. The long, hard campaign was to be tested at the polls. Both sides were confident. That night, the votes were counted, and the results were announced. The PLP emerged with a sufficient number of House of Assembly seats to form the government. Lyndon Pinling would become the first black prime minister of the Bahamas. It was a new day for the Bahamas. <laughs> didn't run away, as predicted, but stayed and expanded. Banking grew. In 1942, there was one bank in Nassau. In 1967, there were over 70. Tourism continued to mushroom, exceeding the one million mark in 1968. And the black Bahamian advanced. More and better schools were built. Jobs and professions were opened, available now to all. In December of 1967, Prime Minister Pinling announced to the House of Assembly that independence was the ultimate goal. In September of 1968, the Constitutional Conference in London with Secretary of State George Thompson presiding provided for the coming of independence. In a speech from the throne at the opening of the legislature in July 1971, Governor Lord Thurlow set the timetable for independence. The Speaker of the House was A.R. Brennan. Jeffrey Johnstone was leader of the opposition. After the most careful examination, my government has decided that the Commonwealth of the Bahama Islands should seek independence after the next general election, but no later than 1973. My government will seek to ensure, through an appropriate program, that the Bahamian people will face with resolution and realism the challenge of nation building. My government is confident that together we will maintain the qualities of a balanced, responsible society. I pray that the blessing of Almighty God may rest upon your counsel. 
Another constitutional conference took place in London's historic Marlborough House in December of 1972. Mr. Roker, Mr. Francis, Mr. Maynard, Mr. Isaacs, leader of the opposition, and Mr. Turnquest accompanied the Prime Minister. And Milo Butler was present as Governor General designate, preparing for the high office he would assume after independence. British Secretary of State, Sir Alec Douglas Hume, delivered the opening remarks. Your Excellency, Honorable Prime Minister, Honorable Leader of the Opposition, uh, Senators, and Honorable Members of the House of Assembly of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, may I, on behalf of the British Government, welcome you all to London and thank you all for accepting our invitation to come to this conference so important for the destiny of your country. It has long been the declared and sincere policy of successive British governments to leave the dependent territories of what was once the British Empire to independent status. Then they can stand on their own feet and be counted among the free sovereign nations in their own right. Then they return home to report the outcome of that conference to the nation by radio. The Independence Conference began its first working session on Wednesday, December 13th, and ended on December 21st. Here is what that historic conference decided. The Bahamas will become a new sovereign state on July 10, 1973. The name of the new independent state will be the Commonwealth of the Bahamas instead of the Commonwealth of the Bahama Islands. In accordance with our expressed intention for an independent Bahamas to make application for entry into the Commonwealth, the British government undertook to sponsor the Bahamas application. The British government also agreed to use their best endeavors to facilitate the applications by the Bahamas for membership of the United Nations and other international bodies. The independence constitution will be the supreme law of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas and will prevail over every other law. Suddenly, it was July 6th, 1973. The seven months had somehow flown by. And now Prince Charles, heir to the British throne, was arriving for the events of independence for the Bahamas. a special representative of the Queen. As the HMS Minerva pulled into Prince George's dock, Prime Minister and Mrs. Pimley arrived to bid the Prince welcome. <laughs> Commissioner of Police, Salatio Thompson, and Assistant Superintendent, Fernanda, were the escorts. His Royal Highness inspected a guard of honor mounted by the Royal Bahamas Police Force. Then he walked through historic Rawson Square for the welcoming statements. Radio, television, and newspaper teams from all over the world were on hand to record the momentous occasion. with utmost pleasure and satisfaction the fact that our royal visitor is the heir to the British throne and the head of the Commonwealth in the future. We feel that this lends unique authenticity 
to what we expect to be a splendid and memorable occasion. Your Royal Highness, on behalf of the government and the people of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, and with personal greetings from my wife and myself, you are most welcome. During the course of my stay in Nassau, I am greatly looking forward to meeting as many Bahamians as possible and to witnessing the various events that have been arranged to celebrate independence. With that, the squad celebrations began. The next day, July 7th, the Prince alongside the Minister of Transport, the Honorable Darrell Rowe, viewed a regatta race off Old Fort Montague. As part of the independent celebrations, a series of athletic events were held. Athletes from all of the family islands participated. Sunday morning, July 8th, a national day of prayer. The churches of the nation came together for an ecumenical church service at Clifford Park. The occasion was arranged by the Bahamas Christian Council. Lessons were read by Prime Minister Finley and the Prince of Wales. Prayers were delivered by denominational leaders, and the President of the Council, Reverend Dr. R. E. Cooper, delivered the sermon. Immediately thereafter, Prime Minister Pembing's news conference before a battery of microphones, cameras, and reporters from all over the world. I, I too should like to bid you a good morning, or is it just a little after noon now? And to say again how happy I am to see all of you here. I trust that everything is going well for you. It is apparently going very well for us Bahamians. You might have been told that I would not have had a prepared statement this morning, but I nevertheless thought it advisable to say to you that it, it does appear that peace and calm prevails all over the country. Those of you who were at the religious service this morning might well have got the feeling that I did. It was a tremendous uplift to me. And as you saw the representatives of the various, various religious denominations take part in that service. I thought it was rather symbolic of the thrust of the whole people forward towards nationhood as the countdown begins today. That same afternoon, the National Arts and Crafts Exhibition at Jumbe Village, the cultural center for the Bahamian arts. The theme, only art endures. A wide variety of Bahamian art was on display for Bahamians and non-Bahamians to see. Oil paintings, watercolors, metal and seashell sculpture.
from the traditional to the abstract. Greatly influenced, obviously, by the spectacular climate and ecology of the Bahamas. The exhibit was co-chaired by James Rowe and Hervis Bain. Monday morning, the next day, July 9th, Prince Charles arrived at Frederick Street to lay the cornerstone of the Central Bank Building, which, when completed, would regulate the monetary standards of the Bahamas banking system. Deputy Prime Minister, the Honorable Arthur D. Hanna, welcomed him. It gives me great personal pleasure and pride. The construction of this Central Bank symbolizes the bold expansion of the Bahamian economy. I do very much hope that this bank will be a success and that all those secretaries, clerks and cashiers who seem to inhabit such places enjoy working in it and feel they are contributing something important to the new Bahamas. Clifford Park began filling up early as tens of thousands came to witness the historic moment of independence. A long list of notables arrived and were seated under the main pavilion. Among them, Sir Lawrence Simmons, who served as first premier of the Bahamas. a living legend and national hero.
began at 10.20 p.m. A vivid portrayal of Bahamian heritage, culture, and history. would soon be lowered for the last time. Members of the clergy of the Bahamas offered a joint prayer. Then the moment was at hand. Prime Minister Pimling and Governor Sir John Paul walked out to the center of the field. 